Hello. It is time to worship the Lord. It is Sunday, the Lord's Day. Let us seek instruction in His Word. I invite you to follow me as I read from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6, verses 12 to 15. Matthew 6, 12 to 15. Thus says the sacred text. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Bless us now that we may be enlightened, that we may see your light, and in your light may we find wisdom. Lead us, Lord, and illuminate each step of our pilgrimage as we walk firmly in the direction of the perfect union that you have for us with you in Christ Jesus. In the name of whom we pray. Bless us now, Lord. Feed our souls. Amen. Matthew in the Gospels. He is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He is Matthew Levi, a tax collector, a publican, as they say, as they used to say in those days, who had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. Now I ask you, did you have already a changing encounter with Jesus? Or it is all just religion to you? No hard feelings. Do not misunderstand my words. I just wish that you have that encounter. And I just thought that this is something upon which you should ponder. From the fact that Matthew was a tax collector, we may safely presume that he was a well-educated man, differently than most of the, of the apostles, of the disciples of Christ. He was not a fisherman. He was educated, knew how to read and write and knew how to count. He was perhaps the nerd of the group. He had a pen in his hands. But he was also a collaborationist with the foreign power. He was seen as a traitor, like all tax collectors who collected taxes for the Romans in Israel. And the others probably were suspicious of him, if not filled with downright hatred of him. But Jesus taught them to forgive. He taught them again and again the principle of forgiveness. So they walked together. And Matthew, to him, tradition ascribes the first gospel in the Bible, 
the gospel according to Matthew. It presents Christ as king, the king of kings. The new Moses, the prophet, Moses predicted that would come and would be greater than him. He uh, was the lion of Judah, Christ, in Matthew, the one who walked in Moses' steps from the beginning, from the flight to Egypt and the return to Judea, to the move to the top of the mount where he proclaims the law of the new covenant, the new covenant in the blood of Christ. You see, prayer is part of the instruction of Jesus and part of the Sermon on the Mount, the Magna Carta, the constitution of the kingdom that you will find in the gospel according to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. There you will find a lot about prayer and how to pray because it is part of the instruction that Jesus gives and also a central aspect of his life. Christ was always retiring to pray alone. And he spoke a lot about prayer. He said that communion with God in prayer was fundamental. He practiced it, he taught it. Not for show, but in solitude. Not vain repetitions, but meaningful words that come from the heart. And the Lord's Prayer, that famous prayer that most of us know by heart. In the uh, Didache, a document of the first century, which was almost chosen to be part of the Holy Scriptures. The teaching of the 12 apostles, a very famous book of the primitive original church written around the year 100 AD. It says that every Christian should pray the Lord's Prayer three times every day. But you see, Jesus himself said that prayer should not be repetitious. You must pray, but you must mean the words and understand them. So, we should pray the Lord's Prayer, but not because it has some kind of magical power, but because its meaning must get into our heads and into our souls that we may be transformed by what the prayer says. Each phrase of this prayer is profound and changes our worldview and our lives. Each one is a test of our Christian piety. Only the truly spiritual person can consciously, consciously make these petitions that we find in the Lord's Prayer. We are not going to discuss now all of them, but just this central one, which is forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. All petitions are important, but this central one is perhaps the most important of all Asking for God's mercy and trusting in God's grace is the most important prayer that anyone may make. Oh God, have mercy 
on me, a sinner. Forgive me, bring me a new life. Repentance, conversion, that is the fundamental tenet of our faith. It is the essence of the gospel. But here, it speaks about forgiving debts. You see, it is unthinkable to the greedy that he may forgive those who owe him, forgive debts. And yet, this is what Jesus says, literally. It is counterintuitive to anyone who was trained to live in modern society to go around forgiving debtors their debts. But, you know, even in the Old Testament, or as some prefer, the First Testament, financial debts in the law of Moses are to be forgiven every seventh year. And then every 50th year, the year of the Jubilee, this law, unfortunately, was never obeyed by the Jews. It was never proclaimed in Israel. But it is there in the law of Moses, the Jubilee year, when all debts are forgiven, but also every seven year period. The idea behind this law was to avoid the possibility of permanent impoverish impoverishment. But it was never lived out. It was supposed to give to all a chance of economic recovery. It is a beautiful idea. But here in the Lord's Prayer, it serves also as a metaphor, a metaphor, a symbol for the spiritual debt that we have with God. We're all debtors to God because he's holy, 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 and we, we are not. We are not. And so we are in debt because we rebel against God's proposal that we live in covenant with him, a covenant of holiness. You see, Jesus also taught his disciples the parable of the unmerciful servant. You will find in you will find this parable in the chapter 18 of the gospel, according to Matthew, verses 23 and on. Let's remember what the king, who in this story represents God, what he said to his servant, the unmerciful servant, who would not forgive his, debit, his debtors, even though the king had forgiven him, an even greater debt. The text says, the master called the servant in, and then he said, you wicked servant, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you. That's why we find here an epilogue after the Lord's Prayer that says, the, the Bible tells us that Jesus said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. 
the word of the Lord. The meaning of this clause is disputed. Many see it as a condition for God's forgiveness in terms of causality. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. But this is not how it works. What is here being described is the life of the disciple of Christ. The life of the person who is born again in Christ. That's why I say the whole prayer is a test of true Christian piety. Only the truly spiritual man can pray this. It is the life of the spirit within us. Only the person that is truly spiritual can say this. That person is not only forgiven, but also forgiving the truly spiritual person is both forgiven and forgiving. Everybody has once in a while difficulties forgiving other persons. Let's be honest. It is okay. It is just human. And yet, if one truly has Christ living in his or her heart, if one has received Christ as Lord and Savior, it is to be expected that eventually forgiveness is granted. If you do not practice forgiveness, then it is likely that you are not impacted by the immensity of God's love and grace. If one has already understood God's mercy, then it is only natural that one is also humble and merciful. Be perfect, as the Lord your God is perfect. Jesus said, be merciful, as the Lord your God is merciful. Our Lord taught his disciples. And this is why the great Canadian theologian Eugene H. Peterson, who wrote the famous Bible version called The Message, so beloved by Christians all around the world, and which I recommend when translating Matthew 6, 12, this part of the Lord's Prayer we are considering. He chose the formula, Lord, keep us forgiven and forgiving. Because it is a petition. It is one more petition in the Lord's Prayer. It is a request, a plea. Lord, make me forgive. Lord, make me into a forgiving person. This is why we can be sure that this is a person who is going to be forgiven. Because this person has experienced conversion. Because this person has experienced transformation. Metanoia is the Greek word. A spiritual transformation that moves the person from going away from God into a different trajectory toward God. Otherwise, a person would be proud and selfish and would have no desire to change and would have no desire to become forgiving. It is the incorruptible seed which is present within us that causes such a change. A seed, like St. Peter says in his first letter, a seed that is blossoming into a tree of life which is 
the true vine to which we are connected as branches, which is Christ in us, which is our reconciliation to God. No one is going to lose God's favor because one has difficulties forgiving someone for a while. However, there is no justification without sanctification. This is what we learn in the New Testament. Without sanctification, no one will get to see God. This is what we read in the letter to the Hebrews. There is no salvation without a walk toward holiness. And holiness means being good. It means forgiving. The Bible teaches that a person who truly lives in union with Christ, the saved ones, the saints of God, they are a forgiving people. And the one who lives in Christ, he wants to become. He wants to learn to become a forgiving person. So God bless you, dear brother, dear sister, dear listener of the word. God bless you. May you obtain this blessing. The blessing of being able to pray the Lord's Prayer and to pray with me consciously and meaningfully, meaningfully. Father, make me forgiven and forgiving. Always. Father, make me forgiven and forgiving. Amen. Let's pray now. Father, we ask that your name be hallowed. We ask that your kingdom come. We ask that you keep us aware that we depend upon you, that you are a God of providence who gives us our daily bread. We ask that you forgive us and that you keep us forgiving, that you change our hearts and make us holy, that you deliver us from evil around us and within us, because you have all the power. Glorious God, you have all the glory and we don't want any of it. May your name be praised now and forever. Bless your people. We pray. Amen. And now, receive the benediction. You, who were not the people of God, but you have become the people of God. You, who had not achieved mercy, but now you have been given mercy. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.